Welcome everybody uh, to our session on accountability impossible without prioritization. Um, my name is David Dunning and my co-presenter today is, is Dan Dewis. Um, we're going to spend uh, an hour today uh, chatting through some interesting topics. We're going to have a couple of um, uh, pauses to ask you some questions. Um, hopefully it will be an interesting session. Um, this is in uh, uh, Zoom, so you, you you can use the chat function and we'll try to answer questions as we, as we go along. And we'll, we'll certainly answer questions uh, post the event if we haven't been able to pick them up in the session itself. Yeah. So um, we'll introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm David. Um, I'm chairman and uh, uh, CEO of a, of a couple of companies, only small companies, nothing huge. Um, I'm lead author on this thing called Business Integrated Governance, which is a framework that helps us to connect strategy to delivery. And I've been co-opted into the BSI's G1 Governance Committee um, to uh, uh, represent that and to support the, the development of governance of organizations, which is ISO 37000 and various derivatives of it. And I'm an active member in that. And my colleague, colleague today from uh, Transparent Choice is Dan. Hi everyone, I feel really ashamed after David. That's a great introduction to, to, to yourself, David. Um, I'm the, I look after customer success at, at Transparent Choice. So I'll, I'll do the spiel uh, in a little bit, but, but basically we, we provide prioritization software. Um, but alongside that, um, those of us that know us know we like to we like to understand prioritization and think around the topic and, and get to learn about it from folks like you, David, from our clients. So yeah, now's a chance just to play back some of the stuff we've learned um, and meet some new people. Cool. Um, well, let's dig in. So our agenda then, um, I'll present to you um, uh, the importance of accountability and prioritization, and I'll frame that in terms of strategy, de strategy delivery. We'll talk about the challenges of balancing business as usual, value generation and change at, at a macro level before we start prioritizing any um, bits and pieces beneath that level. We'll ask you guys, um, um, tell us um, tell us a little bit about how uh, prioritization is or isn't working for you. How do you spot, what are the signs for you that prioritization isn't, isn't working? That, that will be very useful for the rest of the session. We'll talk a little bit further about how we translate objectives and targets into scores that we can prioritize with. That's uh, a little bit of theory that, that Dan will outline for us. And then Dan will um, offer us an interesting uh, scenario. Uh, we've tried to make it a bit realistic. We've tried to talk through uh, uh, an example that hopefully will resonate with, with you guys. And um, we'd also then like to ask you, uh, what have you tried to, to do to get prioritization working? Um, have you had some good attempts? Are you getting nowhere? Is it, have you got something absolutely fine? Please, please share with us. And then we'll talk about some possible first steps. If you want to do something about where your prioritization is and how that fits with your business, we'll, we'll offer you a, a life cycle and a, an approach to that. I'm just gonna check that nobody else is in the waiting room. No, I think that's all good. Okay, um, just as a, a, uh, uh, a heads up then, if I can find my mouse, there it is. Um, we're gonna use Slido today. So um, some of you have used Slido before. Um, Slido is very good on your mobile phone. If you can um, find slido.com on your mobile phone. Um, we're gonna have a, a, a appropriate moments, we're gonna have a couple of questions and you'll be able to tap in the answers on your mobile phone. And it'll ask you for an event number and the event number is there on the screen, but it, it'll also appear on the screen at the point at which we, we ask the questions to. So just a little, little heads up there. We're gonna ask you to try and use Slido. Right, um, let's dive in. So, um, topic one, the importance of accountability and prioritization. And it really should read the importance of accountability and prioritization to strategy delivery. That's, that's what we're interested in. Uh, because delivering organizational strategy is about um, uh, a couple of things, really. Um, our organizations um, are looking to stay in business, they're looking to grow, they have goals. Um, they're looking to strive to, to deliver value today and for tomorrow. They, that, their organizations are, are split between activities that um, help them run the organization to deliver that value, to operate as an organization, 
and they have um, entities that change the organization to improve for the future, to add new products and services to our, to our portfolios. And um, I guess we have limited resources, so we have to find a way to, to balance um, our business as usual activity, the value generation and change work that we do. And uh, you'd hope that um, you expect, and perhaps we do, um, have a, a model that, that um, enables us to, to listen to our outside world, to process what we see and hear, to turn that into strategy, to get that through our business, and to, to complete that as some kind of uh, systematic closed loop control. Um, I'm not entirely sure everyone has it um, that slick, but some people really do, and it's very impressive to see. But what, basically what we're looking to do looking for organizations to do is, is listen for opportunities and threats from the outside world. We're looking to translate that into our reality, um, turn the business drivers that implies into realistic strategies, um, turn the strategy into and break that down into uh, respective objectives, targets and challenges that we can task people with, clearly communicate those and uh, explain to the business uh, the, the priorities that those objectives, targets and challenges have, deliver against it, collect and measure, um, realign and, and course correct and go around the circle. And to, to achieve this, um, we, we need a whole bunch of things, um, IT, um, operating models, governance frameworks, support, assurance, all that kind of stuff. But the, fun the fundamental component is accountable people. People being accountable make sure this happens. If we haven't got accountable people, it all falls apart. So, so let, let's let's start there. So, how do how do we connect then to prioritization? How how do I make that that leap? Well, um, thinking about accountability, we all we all know what the definition of that is, or at least um, there, are, there are several definitions of accountability out there. But uh, accountability um, is is different. Responsibility. I'll, I'm not going to go into that right now, but Basically, the, the way in our organizations that, that we establish this from a, from a, from a top level is um, hopefully we uh, listen to our uh, shareholders, our owners, who, who give us uh, the business purpose and, it, and its goals. We have to um, listen out for regulatory imperatives to see where we have to change what we do based on um, uh, legal necessity. There are emergent matters, problems that arise, um, opportunities that emerge um, that we should uh, avoid or perhaps even exploit and we have to take into account our current state our capability what assets we have the operating model we work with and so on and um, our strategic process I guess is then to turn that into a, a vision um, a picture of future state that uh, uh, hopefully all of us can can uh, recognize and move towards and then develop that into a strategy a sequence um, to deliver that and achieve that with and a strategic plan, which is uh, maybe some kind of timing of, of activity and workloads to, to, to achieve that. And of course, we've got constraints. There's only so much funding we can get. There's only so many people. There's only so much technology. We have constraints. And um, it must be obvious then that um, we're even starting to prioritize with our strategic objectives. So, um, while we're establishing, prior, establishing accountability, we, we have to uh, even prioritize in that process. And then what we're looking to do is to take that strategic plan, cascade those object, cascade that into objectives and, and um, tie that up, empower people to, to uh, take on those objectives and, and to achieve them on behalf of the organization. So there's some uh, pretty straightforward motherhood and apple pie up front, but um, building on the proposition that, that accountability is, is core to what we do. And um, uh, uh, with, with it, by accountability, we need an owner who has priority and, and empowerment. So um, if we um, have got an objective, then if, I'm, if, if I myself am an accountable person, um, I'd be looking to understand what the business case for that objective is so that I can convince others that it's important. I'd be looking for some kind of uh, delegated authority um, within which to tackle that objective. Um, I've been perhaps seconded and, and, and made available um, from the organization or whichever part of that um, it's, it's appropriate that I come from. 
Um, and, but then to, to build the accountability, I need um, to not understand my stakeholders. I need to be able to plan and control um, what's happening um, uh, against this objective. And I need, of course, resources and funds to make this happen. And uh, hopefully this will happen with uh, some support to enable me to um, be accountable, to run my process. And I'm going to be held to account and people are going to check that I'm doing the right things the right way. But the most important part of this is the bottom bit. We need to get some resources. We need to get funding. And um, this, this is the trick. Um, the, 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 the proposition I'm putting to you is there's no point in having authority or a business case or having all the plans and controls and stakeholder engagement in the world if uh, I'm not getting the resources and funding I need. And I mean more than just um, having these things appear in a budget. I mean actually getting hold of them. Um, and the point is that um, to get hold of them, I'm making choices. And unless we prioritise, the deployment of resources to my point of accountability can be a bun fight. Um, for, for those that are uh, not English, that that's that means um, that it can, it can be difficult. So so priority prioritisation um, primarily is fundamentally underpins being able to be empowered, which underpins being accountable, which underpins strategy delivery. So for us. Prioritization isn't just something we expedite because we have to do it to stop squabbling. It, it's a fundamental necessity to enable us to deliver um, strategy effectively. Okie dokie, I will pause. So um, what are the challenges then in uh, balancing our business as usual, value generation and change? Well, wouldn't it be nice if, um, if it was uh, that simple? Um, because I, I've said earlier that, that um, to, uh, for our organization to achieve our purpose, we're, we're going to have to um, share our funds and resources and leadership time between keeping the lights on, um, our IT, our logistics, our finance type activity, our value generation, our product development, our, our product delivery. Uh, maybe our value generation is, in fact, projects in the case of engineering and construction colleagues. But we have to deliver, deliver change as well. We have to take opportunity. We have to respond to external threats. Um, we have to do all of these things. The problem is, though, that um, we don't um, split our organizations directly into these simply controllable chunks. Um, while business as usual is um, typically broken down into dedicated permanent uh, business units, our value generation typically spans the business and needs input and involvement from the whole business. And change, while it might well be um, change within a single function, strategic change is, is temporary and cross-functional. And it's difficult um, to, to deploy resources um, between options is, is very hard. And um, al although um, it might well be pretty straightforward to deploy resources into, into uh, business units because we have clear business targets to achieve. And, and we may find it reasonably okay to dedicate resources to, to strategic product teams. Um, working on projects where there are lots of projects and lots of possibilities and lots of, lots of options for, for spending that resource, it's very difficult. And not everyone is, is all that great at, um, at developing the most perfect of business cases. And just to illustrate the uh, problem a little bit further, um, taking that diagram we talked about earlier, if we work at that very highest level to, to, to get from our purpose to the, to the vision of our, of our of future state uh, through a strategy that um, introduces us to some objectives we're looking to achieve, we have to get that done through our organization. And how do we get those objectives into those organizations? Well. Um, you'd hope that in, in Department 3 here, we, we can respond to that objective with a departmental business plan, which shows how I'm going to break those objectives down into sub-objectives, into teams that uh, deliver those, those targets, that business as usual activity. That's pretty straightforward to achieve, perhaps, if we're talking about um, uh, business as usual activity. But our change activity um, is, is slightly more difficult. Um, but... I guess uh, most of us may recognize taking objectives into a portfolio and making a portfolio business case 
and breaking that down into sub-objectives and starting then to define the projects and products that, that comprise that portfolio, which respond to the business case. And we may have a change activity that's in this, in this strategic portfolio. We might have change activity that's happening in these teams. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. And uh, how do we how do we prioritize all this stuff that we do? Um, it's it's not uh, not that straightforward. Um, most of us um, prioritize by basically allocating uh, fistfuls of, of resources and funds to departments, which is pretty straightforward because these are quite historical and have clear targets and performance levels um, to achieve, and 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 that they have been achieving periodically. But um, how, how do we um, define what resource allocation uh, in balance with business as usual resourcing? How, how do we decide what we, what we give to a portfolio and how do we deal with um, uh, the, 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 the lower level allocations of funds to, to projects which might well be um, quite a way down the food chain? So it's, um, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. This is just a difficult scenario. Um, but maybe it's time to, to, to face it and do something and make it more systematic. Just to labor the point a little bit then, I think I've kind of covered this. Um, in terms of uh, prioritizing, we'll, we'll uh, uh, allocate resources um, to departments that have taken on objectives. And um, that, that should be pretty straightforward to operationally manage. The strategic objectives, the very big, important, expensive, valuable, um, high, high level um, strategic changes that we need to make as a business. They're quite easy to create, to allocate fistfuls of cash for too. But the tricky bit is, is in how do, how do we um, prioritize funding for, for lower level uh, changes? How, how, do we, how do we fund projects that, are, that sit within a department or maybe affect two departments? Um, we need to have all this stuff visible so we can avoid duplication and, and coordinate it. And it would be straightforward, wouldn't it, if all the resource was was um, consumed in one department, but some of these projects are, uh, are cross-functional. And, and funding and making choices in this area is, is something that, that's quite difficult. But our, our goal is to empower people um, in their business, to, to give them funds to give them resources to give them authority to go away and do what they need to do but again the the, the tough bit of this is is prioritizing projects so we're not going to talk about today prioritizing departments or depart prioritizing objectives um, within a, a a strategic portfolio we're going to just tackle this cha challenge today by looking at um projects and and uh take on an example that will bring this, this scenario to life. Okay, I think that's me done for the minute. Um, so that's hopefully set the scene. Um, so, um, time for a question, guys. Um, prioritization, spotting when it isn't working. Um, what's your view of how well prioritization is working in your organizations? And if you're not happy with how it's working, what, what's, what symptoms are you seeing um, that, that show prioritization isn't um, ha happening as effectively as it could be? So um, please have a go um, at Slido. Um, Slido.com there uh, is the site to go and have a look at. Um, the event number 4064-985 is the, is the thing to, uh, is the number to type in. Um, and uh, there's there's one I've seeded the uh, the poll with just in case anyone uh, no one had anything to say, which is unusual. Um, the the first example there is that um, well, prioritisation isn't working. It means my objectives keep slipping. I'm not able to uh, to dedicate resource um, to this objective or, or that, uh, so my objectives keep slipping. And some more, some more. Just, let's just go through them. Um, we, uh, crikey, arguments about who gets resources, yeah, and uh, projects get delayed. Um, uh, role confusion, lack of accountability, timeline slipping, projects unattainable. Um, yeah, delay, 
There's lots of comments. Everything's a priority. Well, everything has a priority, but everything is um, <laughs> yeah, not, not being able to make a decision as to what the priorities are. Um, objectives poorly defined. Yeah, if we can't define the objectives, how can we prioritize them? Um, complaints about too much work. Well, absolutely. Dan, what, what, are, you, what are you making of these? Well, I, I think we've had nerve, David. Uh, I, was, I was thinking they might pop in one at a time, Dan, and we'd be comfortably able to just pick off one or two and, and just chat them. But um, there's a lot no, of it's quite, there. it's quite entertaining watching you wrestling with a cold and a, a little deluge of uh, Slido things kind of coming at you. But I mean, we, we, we hear about, you know, these sort of things, you know, all the time. And, and you know, I don't know if it's reassuring or, 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 or demoralising to see that, you know, they're, they're still out there and burning bright um, in terms of things that are, uh, are holding people back. Um, and, and what I'd say is a lot of what we've, we've talked about so far is quite mechanistic in terms of structure, um, but actually it's people who end up on the pointy end of all this. So, you know, it's, 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 it's the people who are delivering stuff that, that get frustrated because actually, you know, they haven't got clear direction. Um, the Gold Coast, you know, the Gold Coast are moving. It's just, just demoralizing um, and frustrating because, you know, this stuff can be fixed. Well, one I like there, um, this is a really good one. I like it. I don't know who did it, but um, unnecessary escalation. Mm -hmm. I guess if we're not effectively prioritizing, then we're not giving people empowerment. So every time they get a little problem, they run to the boss to fix it. And, and I think that's a sign of, you know, for us, you know, prioritization isn't working when the boss has to kind of get involved at a micromanagement level. Um, you know, because if, 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 if they're getting stuck into the detail all the time, they haven't got a process that's doing his job loudest voice syndrome we know that one yeah but i don't know if anyone's heard the phrase hippo the highest important um pay the highest important highest paid important person hippo the the, the person that that who basically did, uh, dictates and drives everything that everyone um uh works around uh, like that's the loudest voice syndrome absolutely but it's a good, good old hippo yeah, look, there's a bunch of decision science kind of like stuff goes around that, but we all know it from kind of, you know, you know, being in that meeting, right? Someone just dominates it and then suddenly that's setting the direction for, for what's talked about. And it's just, if, if, the, if that person happens to be incredibly smart and know everything, then you might get away with it. But, you know, how often does that happen? I guess the problem is with, with somebody that's really smart, they can only handle so much information. And um, if a lot of things change at once and they're thrown a whole lot of information, how can they possibly um, make uh, realistic decisions taking that information into account? And, if, and, um, and in reality, the, the, most, the more important you get, the less knowledge you're going to have of the detail, right? So, you know, you might be able to see things from on high, but you're going you're to miss a lot of the detail that goes with that. So I'm, I don't know you, Dan, but I'm, I'm concluding that if, if people are... Um, I don't know how many points that is. It's quite a few. Um, there's a lot of points here that's, that have popped up um, of when people have spotted that prioritization isn't working. Um, that to me gives a really good reason perhaps to get on top of prioritization and, and make it a bit more systematic. Yeah. And I assume we'll, 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 we can get, we can get this written up and shared with folks after the day, can't we? So uh, I can do that if, if, if you want me to. And so it just gives people that little checklist for knowing when things aren't quite right. So every event so far, when people have, have done this, I've basically captured this, um, create a little response and group them and, and play that back. So we'll definitely write this up. But please keep chipping away, folks. Keep adding in. But uh, we've, we've only got a certain amount of time. So so we'll we'll uh, we'll crack on. And I think um, you get a rest from my voice. And it's I think it's time for Dan. Translating awesome. objectives. Oh, no, a little bit more of me. Sorry. I think that's a little bit more of me. Oh, no, uh, no, it's me. Yeah. Right. So um, for those of you that have been on webinars with me and Stuart is down there, down there as well, um, you know, we love to talk about AHP, which is the analytic hierarchy process. So this is a, a sort of decision science um, solution. It's quite cool. Um, and it's basically designed to translate, um, you know, strategic intent into a quantifiable outcome, a zero to 100 score for all your projects. Um, there's decision science in it. There's, you know, lots of math, psychology, all this good stuff. Um, you'll get these slides after from David and uh, you can even, you can read a little ebook uh, I've uh, pulled together, um, which you'll see is part marketing, part training, 
um, for the, and then sort of part labour of love on my part because uh, I quite like doing that sort of thing. So um, yeah, we, we, we're not going to go into HP in massive amounts of detail. Um, needless to say, we believe to do this properly, you need to be able to quantify the value of your projects um, because that quantification is going to give you a way of creating transparency um, and, if you like, an analytical approach to outcomes. Um, and the key point here is if you've got an analytical approach, you can produce a system and a process which is fair and start to move away from, from that bum fight uh, that, that David talked about. Um, bum fights have their place, but hopefully not the workplace. Um, so, oh, sensitive, there we go. Um, so again, um, we're, going, we're going to keep this super basic in terms of the kind of AHP stuff. Um, and we do webinars on that all the time if, if you want to learn more about, about this or you know, have a look at our, our software that, that provides it. But, but the key point here is that we need three ingredients to do really good quantification-led AHP prioritization. So the first is we need to score projects. So that sounds really simple, right? But this is about coming up with a list of things that I could or critically could not do. So it's a bunch of activities that I pick from. So if it's something you have to do, we're not going to include it. Why? Why prioritize something you have to do? Um, just figure out how to do it. But the point is, if I've got a list of things that I could pick from, then I can make a sensible strategic choice about which ones to pick. Um, so first, yeah, clarify my, my projects. And, and, and then we come up with what we call criteria, which is a sort of framework. We've got a bit more of that coming. And that's how you score those projects. So again, we, we come up with a, a, a way of quantifying the value to the organization of those projects. The next Lego brick is uh, estimates. So this is really being able to quantify how much effort a project takes. And it's really important to be able to quantify effort because if you quantify effort, you can then think about the value to the organization relative to what it's going to cost you. And again, you know, we can't always put everything into dollars uh, or pounds. Um, so there's there's an important to, to be able to kind of quantify in some way that's appropriate to you. Um, and finally, you put those two things together, you, you divide one by the other, and then you get value for money. And then this is kind of, if you like, the North Star that, that, that we believe is the basis for a good analytical um, prioritization process. So this is how you quantify the relative worth of the different projects that you could or could not do. So the, this is the bricks. Let's have a look at how we build them. And I think we've got a little case study, a little sort of worked example coming up. Oh, this is very sensitive. There we go. Flip. Before I do, um, believe it or not, when David looked at my original slides, he said, you, you need to put something in a bit more and promote who you are. So normally I'm told I'm too salesy about this sort of thing. So blame him. Um, but, but really just want to say, you know, if this is of interest, um, check our website out. We've got tons of stuff there. Um, this kind of, I think it's this time um, in two weeks, we're doing a webinar with Stuart and I where we'll demo the software and kind of, you know, do our jazz hands um, there um, or get in touch with us. Uh, so again, these, my details will be in the, in the pack going out. So um, you can book a call with me or follow me on LinkedIn um, or, or, or email me or, you know, throw a pigeon out into the air and see if it finds me. So... Okay, worked scenario. So um, what we're going to do today, and, and, and David and I came up with this over a, a sort of shared space in Oxford a, a couple of months ago. We thought it might be kind of fun to play it out. Um, we're going to look at a, 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 an example with four roles. Um, now, there's a bit of stereotyping going on, particularly probably in the images. Um, blame Canva, my presentation software. This is what they came up with when I put in the relevant terms. Um, so um, but, but the point is, I want to look at prioritization from different angles. Because actually, the, the point is to, to do good prioritization, you need to understand, if you like, that wraparound empathy. Because it looks different depending on where you sit in the organization. A successful prioritization solution needs to work for everyone. So we're going to have the sales and ops people if you like, these are teams who need IT support to, to get their um, commitments delivered. We've got the IT team who's got kind of a combination of stuff to do for sales and ops, but also some internal projects they need to do in order to keep the, the wheels spinning. Um, and uh, 
Thanks, Stuart. Um, and then and then leadership, who, who's who's trying to get all this uh, motley crew pointing in the same direction and ultimately kind of delivering the strategy that, that she's built for the organisation. Uh, I'm oh, there we go. Is that right? There we are. So we start with aligning measurement um, criteria to strategy. So. I said to AHP, there's a key part around um, coming up with a criteria framework um, in order to, to measure value of your projects. A little red brick in the corner to remind us. Um, so, you know, you come up with your criteria and, and these are sort of, if you like, the generic criteria buckets that we see time and again with organisations all over the place. Um, and effectively, these are the things we all work for, um, in, in term, whether it's government or, or, or commercial or, or something in between. Um, and the point is, we're going to use, we use a system called Pairwise, which is kind of what it says on the tin. And we're going to look at the relative importance, the relative value of these competing criteria and come up with a way, therefore, of quantifying those relative importance. And against each of those um, criteria, we start to come up with the top measures that define success. So, you know, if financial return is important, as it often is, we might say, look, we want to achieve over 50 million uh, pounds of revenue, gonna kind of have a strong ROI and, and, and profitability. So the, the, the leader is starting to define what success looks like at the top level. And we're gonna to start to see, then see these um, objectives cascade through the relevant teams working for her. And the point is, you know, once you have that framework in place, you can start to identify the gaps. And the key point here is, to, to build on what, on what David talked about with BAU. BAU will take you so far. And, and there's a key kind of analytical challenge here in understanding, okay, if we carry on sort of trundling along as we are, where do we think we'll pitch up? You know, spoiler alert, in this example, it's not gonna be over 50 million revenue, strong ROI, profitability. We, we need to do stuff in order to actually realize these punchy goals that our leader has kindly set for us. And, and actually that's where accountability kicks in. We can have accountability if we get the resource to then deliver that stretch. So we start by identifying where that stretch is. And then what we often find ourselves doing is, is, is coming up with these kind of cross-functional projects. Now, these can bubble up, these can bubble down. Um, these can be thrown at you by a nice consultant who, 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 who's, who's come in and, and come up with some ideas for you. Um, they can come from anywhere. But the point is, and we see this sort of time and again with, you know, more, more with modern bigger organisations, is that getting teams to work together is normally critical to success. So IT can't build stuff in isolation because actually without adoption, it's going to add very little value. Um, you know, the, the, the individual teams, if they refuse to engage with IT, are not going to get the benefit of digital transformation. And, you know, there are these interactions and, 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 and everywhere. And so the, the, the idea is we start to build um, this kind of this cross-functional framework using the same framework as we had at the high level. So we get that consistency in language and structure and, 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 and that weighting that we've developed with the pairwise. And we start to then come up with goals for um, the, 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 you know, what this portfolio of, of activity can do. So maybe we've identified a 10 million revenue gap. We have a goal, therefore, of doing that. And, and what we're going to do then is evaluate projects against how effectively they can deliver against that goal. And a key point here you'll see is that we are covering different bases because actually, you know what, you might have a spreadsheet somewhere that has, you know, couple financial metrics in and that's fine but actually the challenge here is that value has to be defined in the round because actually for almost any organization value is more than a financial metric break that news gently to your cfo if you see them um, because obviously you know they'd much rather the world was just black and white or sort of you know green and white in the spreadsheet um, but actually the reality is you have to think about the strategy and quantifying strategic goals is difficult slash, you know, often quite creative with numbers. Um, thinking about, you know, stakeholders is, is, is very, very hard to quantify in an ROI context, whether that's, you know, people, the environment, 
um, you know, more societal kind of commitments. Risk reduction, you know, these are all things that are critical, but they are very hard to quantify, which is why we're, we're building this framework to kind of put them all together. Right, I could keep talking for this for too long, so I'm going to move my next slide. Hopefully you start to see this picture building of people working together. There we go. So um, we, we come towards this point of very cascading by team. So we started with that kind of cross-functional portfolio. And then we're looking into some of the specific um, areas and saying, right, we've got the same core framework that, that, that's cascaded down from our leader. But let's make it relevant to you, the sales guy in a hard hat. Um, so the sales guy in a hard hat. Uh, has been told he's got to support growth. This isn't really, it's actually the ops guys, Stuart, sorry. Um, but the um, he's got to support growth um, without extra headcount. He's got to limit his FTE uh, growth to 3%. He's got to, you know, reduce time and onboarding. And, and all these punchy things that probably make him feel slightly sick when he sees them kind of thrust him um, through, through the review process. And the point is that the challenge to him is what projects, what initiatives, what ideas, can you find to, to fill the gap between this set of punchy objectives and trundling along BAU? Because actually identifying stuff to fill that gap and then identifying resource to deliver that stuff is how we build an achievable plan and how we build accountability then against those goals. And you know, if you if you don't have the funding, you then should negotiate on the goals. But to have one without the other is is a bit pointless and it just it's just sort of kidding everyone really um and reality always kicks in right <laughs> so now there's a particular kind of piece here um i think anyone who, who works kind of on the it side will know it perhaps particularly poignantly but it's relevant across all connections and that is often teams are both resource and customers simultaneously so you might find yourself in, in a meeting both trying to avoid a, avoid project work and get someone else to do work for you. And you have to then be able to kind of coexist in, in that context of understanding. In some projects, you are there to support. So you're not responsible necessarily for the business outcome, the value generation, but you're responsible for delivering the work. And, and that might be the, the example here in, in this first um, piece where the sales guy needs stuff from IT because they've got to go and do it. Um, Similarly, you know, you, you might be, you know, supporting um, another team. So that, again, a similar kind of use case. But then as an IT team, there are things where you are your own customer. And often this is the case around things like risk reduction, um, where it's really important that you don't let your tech debt get out of control because you're wholly focused on delivering value to the organization. The flip side is you won't last too long as a CTO, if you are solely focused on risk reduction and don't deliver value to the business. And, and that balance has to be something that your leadership take control of with, with your support through a pairwise review. So you start to literally quantify the relative importance of risk reduction to sales to ops. So that's enough of the red brick. Now the blue brick. Um, so we, we talked about having to have um, estimates. Um, and it's really important to have good estimates in order to generate, in order to make this system work. And it's kind of garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, and again, could talk about this for ages, but I promise not to. Um, so, you know, we know optimization bias, padding in, in, multi, in, in, in your estimates, noise from individuals being human, uh, challenge uh, of, of doing the work before you've done the work or estimating the work before you've done the detailed analysis. And critically, obviously, lack of a crystal ball. Um, all make it really hard. I mean, your estimates always will be wrong. However, making them less wrong is really valuable. So, you know, we talk about the importance of making sure subject matter experts are involved in the estimate generation. So there's a proper structured outreach for data collection to make that data as accurate as possible. We see huge value in working as a team to reduce bias. So if you have three people, generating a data point, that data point will have 50% less noise than one person. And that just basically means if I get up this morning and I'm feeling, or maybe Dave, if David gets up this morning feeling like, uh, you know, death warmed up, he's probably not going to make a very good decision. Probably his judgment's going to be impaired. 
So, you know, throw him together with me and Stuart and the three of us will come up with a better school than him on his own. Um, we, we've got, we talk about templates and reference class data. So being able to use reference points and structure, I think is a, is, is a great way to improve estimates. And, and a particular favorite from another of our collaborators, uh, uh, Mike Hannon, he, he, he likes to talk about Murphy's Law across your portfolio. Things go wrong. We know that. Um, and, and, you know, it's silly to suggest they don't. So, you know, why not have a buffer, a shared buffer uh, in order to absorb Murphy's Law without having to have these little pots of, 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 of extra buffer hidden um, everywhere across the portfolio. And we believe that's an important part of a sort of grown up data led um, prioritization process. So into the green brick. Um, in the green brick, we're going to get that data we've just built. We've built it by doing our scoring across our teams. We've built it by um, creating good estimates. And we're gonna throw it into a chart. So, you know, the chart is value, the value to the organization versus cost, which is, you know, how much is this, how, how much effort is this going to take us? And we get some really simple outcomes then, you know, we see in the, the, the top left here, high value, low cost, great, green, do it. Uh, here, low cost, high, high cost, low value, red, stop, it's a pet project, get rid of it. And, and the point is, this is data led. So if you, if you are the, the, the owner of a red project, you're more likely to accept the death sentence if you know that the process to generate that data was fair, visible, rather than being something you're forced to kind of acknowledge um, on, on the hoof. And then actually you flip the same data in around, make it cumulative, and you've got a ranking, and a ranking driven by value for money. So you end up with this nice kind of Pareto curve, um, which is something the economy, the econometrics folk in marketing like to use. And it really just says, do all the projects up until the point where they kind of stop adding a lot of value. And when it goes a bit flat, it just means your projects don't add that much bang for your buck. Um, and find, if you like, the 80-20 cutoff point and form your plan A. And once you start to form that plan A in your team or in another team or in a cross department sort of portfolio, you start to build data. You start to build the ability to make decisions without having to go through huge, complicated political negotiations. And the point is here, there's never enough to go around. Never enough. So you have to decide what plan, who, who, who's plan A, how many plan A's can you afford? Who needs, to, who needs to slip down to plan B? And actually, if you are plan B, perhaps you need to then negotiate those goals again. You need to revisit the, the objectives against which you're going to be held accountable. Because if you, if you can't get the resources to deliver your plan A, it's probably fair that you need to think about what your, your goals should be in the organization. And, and finally, I'll whistle through these so we, we've got time for uh, uh, the, the, the next bits. But, um, you know, the delivery, the deliver, we want the delivery guys uh, in IT to, to feel really positive about the work they're doing, to know that, frankly, if they do their job, they're going to have 90% delivery and every, they're not going to have to beast the team and, and everyone's going to feel good about things. So they can actually focus on what they like doing, which is the work, not the politics that go with it. Um, we, we want the, the, the ops guys and sales guys, again, to know that they can go and do their jobs and not have to kind of spend time maneuvering to try and get extra resource. They, they need to know if IT have promised something in Q2, they're going to get something in Q2. Not they're going to have to spend Q1 worrying about contingency plan for the IT project that never turns up on time. And, and finally, you know, the, the leadership sort of role, um, she needs to know that, that she's confident that the strategy that she's, you know, built is going to be delivered. So she's not going to look like a numpty when she turns around a year later to investors and says, yeah, I haven't done anything with that thing I talked to you about last year. She can show evidence of, of the ability to lead the organization in the direction that she's stipulated. You know, she knows she can hold people to account and she knows the resource, the finite resource she's got control of can go exactly where it's needed to go. And, Google, there's a really good article on Forbes, um, which we sent the link to, um, which, which basically shows if you are fair in your allocation of resources, you will not perform as an organization. If you identify the outperforming bits of your portfolio and overinvest in them, you will outperform the market. So with this model, we can hold people to account. So we can pop our OKRs, the final brick in my little wall, on top of all this model and, and know that actually what we're asking our people to do 
is achievable, not necessarily easy, of course, but it's achievable, it's well structured, and that they can focus on doing it, not on chasing each other around the houses, trying to get favours or, or headcount or all these good things. They know that, 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 that what they've been asked to do is fully aligned to what it is that they're going to be given. And on that note, I'll hand back to David, who I think might have another slide for us. You're on mute, David. David will be performing the next part of this presentation through the medium of mine. <laughs> sorry. Yes, sorry, try not to cough. So um, so we've, we've talked about the highest level prioritization where we're taking those big objectives and we're we're splitting funds between big between departments and functions and and strategic portfolio, and we're, we're prioritising at that level. We've we've then talked about the next level down, which is okay for all that discretionary money that we've got. Um, wh where where can we see bang? Where where are the opportunities to see bang for buck? How how can we build up an information model for each opportunity, and then how do we compare? those opportunities and decide which ones to do within particular areas or, or across the piece and uh, uh dan's talked about ahp as as a tool as, as a method and he's he's very uh quickly slipped past um the, the tool set that that he's got but uh, i don't think it should be swept past that quickly because without some kind of technology capability to make this simple we're all we, we get and as we possibly do, get bogged down in a, in a horrendous nest of in connect, unconnected configuration disasters, which are which are called Excel spreadsheets. Thanks, David. Um, the lens the gift baskets in the post. <laughs> so so um, so if if so, we've got to prioritise at a high level. We've got to cascade. In, we've got to do the big fistful allocation, and then we've got to, to prioritise at a lower level. And Dan's talked through the method. So um, what, what have you guys tried in to do in terms of prioritization? What, what scope have, have you applied prioritization to? What methods have you used? What, what successes and failures? Hopefully, there should be another Slido waiting. I think it's the same one, actually. Um, what have you tried to get systematic prioritization working? Um, I'm leading the... Uh, a leading uh, uh, question, perhaps, um, and a comment saying, "Why has it failed, or why has it succeeded?" Um, and the, the the start of a ten off, it was uh, we have a big scoring sheet for all projects, but compiling information more than once a quarter is a nightmare. So I know there are live projects which should have been killed already, but maybe I don't. Um, what have you tried pairing projects against each other? So uh, some somebody is using pairwise comparison to to score projects. Um, uh, it doesn't talk about scoring against objectives though, which is what I think Dan was presenting. You, you can you can build the objectives in, but it just gets a bit of a nightmare when you get uh, too many uh, too many projects. It's, sort of a, it, it's a lot of work, but we have a, we have a blog on that somewhere. Uh, <laughs> well, on that, the website. There's another good point there. Um, we need to know, understand organization capacity by department. I mean, some department heads would think that their capacity is their own to, to manage, but, but I guess as a business, um, we need to make a case for deploying capacity to a department to achieve um, its business targets, but also set aside uh, time for to contribute to strategic initiatives. And we want to see how much of that is is local set aside for local innovation. So that that visibility of capacity is a, is a very useful model. To have i'm not not sure um how, how many really have a a good uh a a remaining uh capacity picture for the departments to be able to prioritize against um roadmaps and backlogs um i guess that's queuing up what needs to be done i guess that's that's yeah that's that's absolutely vital in the roadmap for, for for your strategy to to drip feed into the business that's the box to put it in just need to figure out you know how to how to, uh, how to put Stuff in the box. Which box? So, yes, a, 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 a choice um, around whether you do something is um, whether it's got a, a, a high value. It's whether you've got the capacity at that moment. Uh, I love that top one, David. The conflicting objectives that could be cherry picked by delivery managers. This is the classic. If management don't can't bloody decide, someone's going to decide for them, um, which isn't typically a very good way of uh, of, of, of delivering strategic alignment. 
unless you get very lucky, you've got very strategically minded delivery managers. Another another question, maybe it's too big one for now, but can, can we prioritise unless we collect time? So so if we don't know what time is being spent on this initiative or that, can we can we really refocus things? If we haven't got time collecting, time collection isn't prevalent in a lot of places, is it? And it, yeah, I mean, we we we, we stumble on this all the time. It's the, it's the the challenge of you need an estimate, but it's really hard to get an estimate. So you don't bother with an estimate, or you just come up with a t-shirt size. There's a sort of you, you you have to compromise somewhere, but we believe being able to differentiate easy stuff from really hard stuff is pretty critical. I know a CFO once that. Uh, recently that spent a lot of money getting their new finance system in place and had a very clear business case for that and they didn't spend much on external resources but no one knew how much internal resource had been spent on it um so so would that have been prioritized ahead of other things if if the true internal cost would have would have was actually known so it's, it's okay been, it's okay because the cfo controls the headcount though oh there you go <laughs> <clears throat> Um, yeah, and the, 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 another point I tried to allude to earlier on is is giving people empowering people. Um, we, we we want to allow them to prioritise within their domains um, and let them get on with things, um, but still have visibility so we we can spot whether we're issues. And, and there's a really good one there about sort of why it failed about reacting and shifting to different priorities. It's um, I think any any prioritisation solution has to be agile. If it's brittle, it will fail. If it's a big, ugly planning process that, that people kind of takes months to, to, to get through, it doesn't work. It has to be something that, that, that has the ability to respond to the you know, market. Well, well, that's vital, Dan, isn't it? Because, I mean, uh, opportunities and threats arise and wane and, and grow. So, um, so, so the, the drivers that underpin your prioritization will, will change over time. So if you can't reprioritize quickly and easily and you don't have the information system to pull that together, um, you can have as whatever cherry on top of the prioritization model you like, but if you can't feed it with good info, it's it's going to be. Uh, How often do you find yourself time. planning, doing your your your, your Q, you know your Q four planning Q one safe in the knowledge that you know you'll never deliver this because the it'll just look different by the time you get to Q two, let alone Q four. That that one confusion between into program prioritization between program. So again, it, it's um I, I, maybe that's alluding to apples and pears being, being having lots of options to to lots of options for projects and they're not being able to compare them to to distribute funding between. So um, and, and yeah, if, there's a sort of we call it sort of portfolio portfolio stuff, but there's a point at which you need to put your put projects into buckets so you can compare if not apples and apples at least apples and pears. Um, rather than you know apples and elephants. Um, so people have tried quite a bit, and um, it, it's there's quite a few things there that people have picked up on. But but uh, I'm not I'm not really seeing anyone who is talking about um, they've got a framework for systematic prioritization that's that's fed by an effective data model that supports that that helps people um, be accountable. Um, uh, assist with um independent assurance uh, that's that's supported by an effective uh capability to make it work so there's 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 quite a bit there's quite a bit to getting um uh systematic prioritization to 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 go and if if all those moons don't align it it, it can be difficult so um people are still typing and so please do um type away folks but we need to sort of move on for now um as i said as we said we will respond to all of these these things um leadership too busy micromanaging managing the setup systematic prosation that that's a very actually i'll just dwell on that for a second uh this this the prioritization engine that the ecosystem needs to be set up um that systematic prioritization is is a, is a model to build and to operate um and and, and it and needs leadership to make it happen so um, yeah, how do you flip people out of uh, uh, paddling as hard as you can, and why not instead just turn on the motor that's behind you? There's a massive cultural component to all this, but I think at three minutes, three minutes till the top of the hour, we might uh, we may not touch it today. Yeah. Okay. Right. So what next? Okay. So um, hopefully then um, we uh, this is this is this is me assuming things. Um, I, I think we can see issues in prioritization um the, the whole process of putting a business case together coming up with a value estimation estimating effectively 
um, identifying risk, which can throw this to wobblies, it's difficult. Um, the ability to compare business cases, um, the, the opportunity uh, from for a project from uh, operations versus night uh, versus sales which one do you choose how how do you take how do you make it uh, objective um there's too always too much to do it, you have to make choices choices are difficult and it ends up being a bun fight we've kind of suggested that um not all of us necessarily have an effective or clear funding and resourcing process some people keep it parochial to retain a bit of influence and power um, we're not necessarily always um, making choices between business as usual and change. We reserve resources for BAU and protect them heartily, heartily and, and projects are, are raided for resources whenever um, there's a target at risk. And, and the symptoms are typically stress, slippage, overspend, under delivery. So this, this is my view anyway. So if you've got... Uh, um, yeah, the peer, peer, there's a bunch of PMI data out there as well, which sort of backs up all this, David. And that's to say, you know, basically the stats get 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 better the more aligned your, your portfolio is. Um, if you if you don't prioritise, you you don't perform. Yeah, and and we see people have tried a scoring system, but they find it hard to make to develop that date. They put an effort in to prioritise for the start of the year, but then don't have an ecosystem to to prioritise ongoing. Um, you've tried rational debate on data, database, but people can be parochial if, if there's not a, um, a systematic independent approach. People can't say no because then you're labelled as you don't have a can-do attitude. So people don't like to make choices and say no to things. Um, the people don't like the, having uh, thinking about making BAU and change choices, um, although they are clearly there to be made. It's not just choices between projects. Um, and we just have to, so basically we just have to cope, <laughs> which, which isn't good. So, um, I guess folks, if you don't want to just have to cope, there, there is a, a way that you could take this forward. And, um, our proposition to you is, um, before we can offer you what the solution is, although Dan can show you some technology for that straight away is, is to try and understand what the problem is to try and shape that, understand who has which problem. And is there a case to do something? Um, uh, because uh, it might well be that uh, you simply need a, a piece of technology to plug into an existing perfectly working culture, but you might need uh, some more help to build a collaborative prioritization approach that, that, that also connects you from strategy to delivery and works at multiple levels. So um, if you did like the idea of taking on some technology, then you might see a, a typical life cycle where we discuss your technology requirements, uh, understand what your technology needs are, understand requirements, show you some kit, get you to use it, get familiar with it, adopt it, extend it and support it. And that might well be a perfectly good life cycle where you can plug some tech in. But if you are not sure that your business is ready and, and, and will have the ecosystem to support the tech, then we can engage you, help you engage with your organization on first steps, i.e. Uh, uh, getting consensus that there is a problem, there is something to solve, to think about how that might be approached, uh, to then discover and then fit the technology into that life cycle. So we can help you on two levels. Um, if, if you need the tech and you're happy to, to, do, um, to, to, to look at uh, a solution because you have the culture already, then, then Dan can talk to you about plugging that in and, and showing you what that looks like. And if, if you want to go on a voyage of discovery and help your business more systematically um, uh, ach achieve accountability through systematic prioritization, um, myself and my colleagues, we'd, we'd love to speak to you about uh, how that might happen. Um, so, either you know, way, for those, you, for those of you that, 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 that are itching to, to have both, uh, we do work, we work nicely together. So, uh, you know, we're, we're very keen that, that that you've got that kind of deployment um, support um, as well as the the nice kit um, in order to make a success of this. So basically, what what we do, or you can contact us, is is um, we're happy to listen to your scenario, um, hear hear your pain. And then and discuss with you if we can help in in either capacity with 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 a technical solution or, or to assist in in uh, uh, adjusting how you guys work to to, uh, to to deliver accountability more effectively. 
crikey, is that it? We've, we've nearly done two minutes over. Um, well, thanks everyone for, for attending. I hope it's been interesting. Um, today was, um, you might have seen some of you, is, is, a, is, the, is the third presentation in a series of five that we're doing in the spring. Um, the next one we're going to run in a couple of weeks time talks about the backbone for strategy delivery. So what, what might be the, the another aspect of, of the technology solution set that uh, gives us a backbone as opposed to prioritization. And then we'll talk on the 12th of April, strategy delivery and thinking big, how, how we wrap all this together. If, you, if your thing is, is um, purpose to vision, to strategy, to delivery and back again, um, we'll, we'll present a pitch that talks about that as well. Um, crikey. Um, so that's kind of it. Um, thanks for listening, everyone. We'll, we'll stay online if anyone has any more further questions to ask or wants to speak. But um, we'll um, thank you for your time. Thank you to Dan for uh, for whizzing through this stuff. Um, 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 yeah, please enjoy your day, folks, and um, hopefully speak to you soon. <laughs>